It's our great pleasure. Now, now I can speak. Now I get recorded. It's our great <laughs> uh, pleasure to have Mason Aslan Doc from present here Yale University visiting us. We just uh, shift to that chair. Oh, yeah. okay. oh, all people. Yeah. One. Yes. So uh, Mesut uh, got his, well, he started physics, studying physics in Turkey, and there he got his master in of science uh, from the Bodici University in Istanbul. I hope I got this halfway right. And then he moved on to Frankfurt in Germany, where he got his PhD in 2017, working on event by event fluctuate of identified particle ratio fluctuations. <coughs> Uh, with Alice, and then he moved on as a postdoc uh, to Heidelberg, where he stayed until 2020, and then he moved on to CERN uh, until 2023, and also since 2020, he's also a research scientist at Yale University, but his center of wave function is still in CERN. Exactly. Yes. And <laughs> Today, he will tell us a little bit more about fluctuation and other interesting stuff. So, please go ahead. Thanks for coming. Okay, thanks for the introduction. It's really a great pleasure to be here. So, in principle, I will be talking about uh, Hebarian collisions with, with the full stretch. So, first of all, I'm going to discuss about the phase diagram in view of these fluctuations. And then, uh, a very recent paper that we put in the archive, which is uh, aiming to find some maybe beyond standard model physics. And this I will describe in terms of methods. So it will be more experimental, but maybe fun to listen. Okay, so I asked uh, Volker if we need introduction, but I think everyone knows what, what exactly this thing. But so I just wanted to highlight it again. So we basically produce this new state of matter, and in the end we just see how it cools down and which phases it, it goes through, and in the end we detect the particles and try to understand how. It looks like this is basically what the nature does, cools down, and, and in the end, we try to understand privacy at headquartered mass, how do they gain their mass, and also this confinement concept that you all know that we don't see any quarks, isolated quarks in the nature. And then, so this is how we see it as an experimentalist because we see that we have got particles. This is the signature that basically uh, the collision gives us, like energy loss spectrum as a function of momentum, and you see that all the particles are nicely visible. Whatever we learn is basically is under this uh, picture. And looking at this, we go back in time and then try to see what exactly happens. And in the end, we try to, once we are sure that we measure everything precisely, then we try to understand how the hybridization phase transition and all these things happen. And of course, while looking at this, so we see some correlations. And the origin of the correlation would also tell us what is the time and what is the source of this correlation and so on. And in the end, I will also discuss a little bit what happens because, as you know, when two very heavy nuclei collides, then the spectators carry quite some charge and there is a close speed of light and they produce uh, the largest magnetic field in the universe. And this magnetic field can also affect QGP. And at the same time, they can also produce, for example, monopole pairs. So isolated, uh, basically, um, the magnets. And this is what we will push in the end. OK, so this is the overall picture. And now I will focus on the QGP phase and, and its evolution. And as I said, so we are dealing with phase transitions. This is the very typical thing that we all know of water. And in daily life, we, we know what exactly happens from these phase transitions from water to vapor or the ice. And then, of course, when you go even push your limits, then you hit the critical point, And above that, you get some kind of a new state, which is super critical for you. So which means that the phase transitions teach us really, really interesting things. And we can even come up with some super things. And then there's another way of looking phase diagrams. So this is this ferromagnetic phase transition of uranium germanite. And this is actually, I like this picture very much because it really looks like what, what we expect to see in heavy ion collisions. And here the temperature is on the level of 40, 50 Kelvin. And what happens is that from paramagnetic phase, so after this, um, uh, this curie temperature, you basically change your phase, your spins are aligned, and you get into ferromagnetic phase. And if you even cool down even further, 
and you get to the superconductivity. So which means that when you play with the thermodynamic quantities of your system, cool it down or change the pressure and so on, you really face with different phases of the, the metal. And depending on which temperature and um, uh, pressure that you look, you might end up with very interesting physics and phenomena. And this is uh, what we expect to see from QCD phase diagrams. It's a conjectural picture, basically, but the temperature here is 10 to the 12, a factor 10 to 12 larger than this picture. And we kind of see a similar expectation. So what is shown here is the uh, temperature as a function of biochemical potential, so to say kind of number density of the conserved charges. In this case, it is the conserved partial number. And the, our guidance is the, the theory of um, strong interaction, which is less QCD. And what we expect to see is that at very high energies, as you can see here is the energy scale, that we would expect to see a crossover, a phase transition, which is smooth and no derivatives is diverging. And if we, for example, discover this at LHC energies, which is sitting here, then it would mean that there should be also a critical point, as I have shown you also in the, in the, the phase diagram of water. And that's why it will be very significant input to the field, and if we can really uh, discover this QCD phase transition in nature. So, can I ask here, maybe it's not to you, but why does the line doesn't go to zero temperature? Is there a deep So this one? Yeah. Which one? Oh, so this the, one? Yeah, this one. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not your plot, I understand. But yeah, they, <laughs> maybe they, I think they just, just, they just want to say that it's con conjectural plot and then it goes somewhere, but exactly where I don't know. Okay, I mean, maybe. They could just, stop at some point, but they don't want to claim. Or something. Yeah, okay. And they also don't want to probably claim a point here. Because here there is a measurement, but here I don't really think that there is a really strong measurement. Because you don't know. Theoretical argument is that we cannot go to zero first of all in transition. Well, maybe there is an argument, but I don't think there is a evidence or something. Basically, to me, it feels like it's a stronger statement than the reason is, but there is only an interval of temperature than going all the way to zero. Yeah, and also this distance is not exactly known, right? Yeah, sure. it's mixed phase. Yeah. That's why okay. to not claim anything strong, it is better to stop there. <laughs> this is Fukushima and uh, uh, and Sasaki, Sasaki, right? Yeah, Sasaki, their paper, they say you cannot go to zero. Yeah. Yeah, I think they have something. So some there is one big paper yeah. by Bain and Hatsuda, mm -hmm. depending how strong you are. Hatsuda and also Fukushima and uh, by Sasaki. Right, because the implication is that if you rule out phase transition at zero temperature, you could still have one at finality, right? Sure. If that's the picture is. Okay, so sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Okay, and then to understand this phase diagram in a better way, as I said, so we have got this um, uh, the, the mass effect in, into play, so we need to include. And the phase diagram that I have been showing you in the previous slide is basically this one physical quark masses as a function of mu b and the temperature. But for example, when we shrink the, the mass, go to zero, then you, what you end up is that, again, the phase transition, but the nature of this crossover, this time becomes a second order phase transition, and which is governed by the so-called universality class, because the phase transitions can be described with this universality classes. And what the lattice QCD basically predicts is that if there is this feature, there should be some sort of critical effects that we should be able to see also in this crossover because of this massless modes. So this is what we are basically hunting for. And so far what we know at LHC energies, this is what is uh, predicted by the lattice QCD is the critical temperature, which is on the level of 156. And from the particle leads, we can also measure freeze out temperature with the standard statistical atomization model. And this is kind of very close to each other. And then what we know is that, again, from this statistical atomization model fits, we can estimate this mu b, and also looking at from the particle ratios. And we, what we know is that it's on the level of 0.7 MeV, which is also very close to zero. So these two things are kind of encouraging. And the goal is that, can we really claim a kind of uh, crossover because it is experimentally not proven? And the signals that we would expect to see is uh, very long correlations because um, uh, the, the correlations length, this is one input. And the other thing is that increased fluctuations. Because if you are very close to a phase transition, small changes in your temperature and pressure would, pressure would lead to um, high 
large fluctuations in the particle density, for instance. But of course, we have to keep uh, in mind some things. Our goal is to discover uh, the crossover. For this, we are searching for criticality. And the tool is the lattice QCD, and try to basically match this tool. Actually, this uh, slide, I get inspiration from <laughs> your slides, uh, uh, all of you. So the, in the theory, so we have got a world, and in the experiments, a complete different. For example, in theory, I've got a static space, a static assumption. And in the experiment, everything is dynamic. So you have an explosion in a very short time, basically everything uh, cools down. In one case, you deal with the coordinates, space and other you are in the momentum space in one case you have got uh, you can use baryons you have got full freedom so that's why you can access uh, net concert quant uh, quantities like absolute but in experiments you cannot do that because not all particles that you can measure so many things that you have to assume so that's why an, an example for example what you measure in an experiment is you count your events and you look at, for example, how many particles that you produce. For instance, it can be in the central barrel or it could be in the forward, and in this case, it's forward. And then you count, and what you say in the end is that if the collision is head on, you call it a central. If it is uh, not head on, then it's peripheral. This is basically kind of a proxy for the volume in case of experiment. And I will come to the issues which is caused by this volume assumption and all that later. Oh, sorry for all standards. Yeah. Uh, I thought the crossover phase transition is kind of established for the Hamilton creation at this rate. I mean, the there's a there's a phase transition, right? Yeah. yeah. On that is QCD, not that no, no, no. Wait a second. Okay, that maybe yeah. so. That's why maybe I ask this stupid yeah. question. So there's a phase transition, mm -hmm. right? If it's not a crossover, what it is? If not, I mean, you, you mean the crossover in the first order? Either crossover, what? first order, second order. It's not, the nature is not known, but Lattice QCD said that it should be crossover. Theoretically, we think that it's crossover, but not yet proven okay, experiment. Maybe, okay, I got a wrong impression. Every every time I saw the talk, the like, Hawaiian yeah. operation always say that the crossover. Yeah, this is what we <laughs> want to see. I, I mean, I thought that, the, first of all, that. There is lattice calculation here. There is the cost. No, forget about lattice. Okay. There is, a, lattice. there is a, a sort of like a, a Bayesian inference by looking at all the data, including HPD and other stuff. They extract so called equation of state, which looks like crossover. That's the only evidence you have. Yeah. But the final word is not set experimentally. So is there any final word? I'm not a finished talk. No, 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 wait a second. I, I really want to come to concrete conclusion. Is there a crossover or not? At the moment, we don't know experimentally. Yeah. Okay. okay. I guess so. We're running a Ryan region for more than 20 years. Yes. Yeah. Nothing good. Okay. Yeah. Got you. Well, I. I wouldn't put that away. I mean, they are. They are like, sort of various, like, uh, you know, Bayesian analysis by putting all this yeah. model calculation, vertical model calculation, and then, then the, all the data. Uh, then the conclusion you, you have some kind of like you know, equation step, which is like a crossover. The speed of sound right? Uh, like the speed of sound. Speed yeah. of sound. Yeah. The speed of sound yeah. too. No, no, no. But the, the earliest work is by Scott Pratt. Yeah, that not is the speed of sound, right? Well, Bayesian extraction of speed of sound. That, that's the equation of state. Yeah. That is essentially the equation of state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On zero mu, just in one point. So, yeah. so I mean, another stupid question. If it's so hard to 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 actually pin down if we have crossover or not as with with variant density equal zero. I mean, this question, of course, to know how we confident in the future we can actually find the creative code. Yeah, this is what I am going to try to okay. explain. Yeah. So what we need to do. Okay, so this is basically the that is yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand right. that. I mean, you have spent 20, more than 20 years, so you haven't figured out what's happened for the for the very simple case, right? Yeah. 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 Another 20 years. Sorry, sorry, you're asking somebody from Turkey, 20 years is 
blink of an eye. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is basically the tool to, that we can connect to experiment, which is this uh, so-called susceptibilities. So you look at this um, uh, the, the pressure and then take the derivative with respect to uh, this chemical potentials of the conserved charges. This can be calculated at mu zero. And in the experiment, the correspondence is basically the cumulants of net conserved numbers. And in this case, I show you an example of second order cumulants of net baryon. As you can see here, there is this volume and temperature term. And experimentally, as I said, it is difficult to handle. That's why we use this trick to cancel it with taking ratios. And I still put here an orange because when you take these ratios, it is still not so clear how to interpret the results, which I will explain in view of volume fluctuations. And in a very simple picture, experimentally, what we do is we just cannot access number of baryons and we use a proxy. A proton. And then what we do is that we count number of protons every event and antiprotons, look at the difference, and then we just histogram it. And in the end, as you can see here, at very high energies, you get very close because mu b gets very close. Namely, that uh, pp bar ratio gets close to it one. But we have a distribution. And what we say is that the, the, the signals, the critical information is on the tails. So experimentally, it is very challenging because we are not trying to con correct the data only in the mean, but we are trying to correct, for example, everything, well, the whole shape. That's why it makes it really challenging, and that's the reason we need also guidance also from the theory. This is very simply what we exactly do. And then what uh, we also know, for example, let's establish, for example, a baseline and some um, news from the lattice QCD. First of all, our baseline is going to be either zero or one with respect to a uh, distribution, which is like Poissonian distribution, the so-called scalar. So which means that if there is no physics, then if I try to look at this ratio, I will, either I will get zero or one. Um, and that's why it's really very simple to interpret. And of the third order cumulants, what we know is that from lattice QCD calculations, we should not see any deviation from this Harun um, class model at close to maybe zero. This, this is what we know. Uh, actually, this, re this is not true. There are deviations even in Kai 2 and these are maybe difficult to establish because it depends how many states you put into HRG model and so on. But if you look, for example, at temperature derivative of Kai 2 in lattice, Kai 2 this one. Yeah, yeah, Kai 2. Yeah, right I mean, if you shrink, then you say that you might be. No, even if you just look at the temperature yeah. derivative of Kai 2. Yeah. There is no way to describe it as HRG at 160 mm -hmm. mm. The slope is completely different already. Okay, but this is not because of the quick effect. Oh, no, it, it could be. It, it could be already at the beginning of chiral crossover, which makes yeah, a division. I, I just want to say that I don't, I don't think that statement is correct, that up to third order HRG agrees with like It agrees to some accuracy, better accuracy than high order susceptibility, yeah. but it's not. We, you, you should not expect it to perfectly agree. Yeah, perfectly, yeah. I, yeah. I cannot say that perfectly. I mean, even here, you have yeah. like this error bars and everything. Yeah, the error bars and the slope is clearly different yeah, yeah, sure, already. Sure. Yeah, sure. But what you see experimentally is that you cannot resolve this. Yeah. And in the, in the third order, it is the same. Because your system is so symmetric. So third order is just zero. Yeah, zero because right. of the symmetry. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But once you go even higher, for example, fourth order cumulus of the ratio, then you really see a clear deviation. And when I discuss with that is QCD community, what the idea is that the critical signals start uh, to be dominant at the six. So that's why our real goal is always to reach experimentally up to six moment, understanding all these individual components. And when we really show that this deviation is there, then I think it will be a uh, discovery of the crossover, so to say. Or interruptions of the energy. Huh? Or interactions in HRG. So beyond the ideal HRG, just, yeah, sure. just repulsive core give you the same negative. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, what I mean is that once you, for example, yeah. exclude all these effects, so you need to isolate your signal, and in the end, if you isolate everything, then you should get this. Yeah, one. okay, but well, I mean that there are effects which give you the same negative, yeah, sure. so that sure, is. Sure, sure. I mean, even uh, this deviation at the fourth moment yeah. or anything, that you can explain with different physics. Yeah. You have to understand each and each. But so I don't think you need a point. Uh, which one? The second point. 
Yeah, so this is attacking. Yeah, they, they, so now I, I will tell you why I do it. So this is actually a quote from Descartes that I like very much, how to approach uh, scientifically to a problem. So the number one, so never accept anything for true. So you have to really make sure that your data and everything is in every step is correct. And the second thing is that divide each of the difficulties under examination into as many parts as possible. So each individual signal and also each individual detector effect, only then you can move on. And in the end, step by step, get uh, to the knowledge of more complex. And more complex is the sixth order cumulus. But to do that, step by step, everything has to be consistent. If anything is not consistent, I think uh, what you get in the end is questionable. And finally, in every step, one has to do review, so generally that everything is really correct. So that's why I like this um, recipe very much. So this is exactly did, what we try to do. Did he also say, because I believe critical point exists, so it exists? <laughs> did he say that? <laughs> did he? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but he doesn't want to speak here. I think so I exist, that's what he said. Yeah. Let's see the appendix. No, sounds very dangerous. Anyway, so let me start with this experimental <clears throat> part. So this is the Alice experiment, as an again very short introduction. We use different detectors, in a tracking system uh, for tracking and vertex TPC for particle amplification together with both, and V0 to have uncorrelated uh, central estimation. And this is the data set. And in the end, this is the two pictures, as I have shown, one is this DVX and one is the speed of uh, the particle to distinguish particles. Okay, so the challenge number one is to identify particles because I need the identity of protons. <coughs> and to do this, we have got two approaches. One is cut-based, which means you are counting tracks once you are, make sh once you are sure that uh, the identity is proton. And then uh, there is this identity method, which is the probability counting. So this is what you have as an input. What you do usually is that you take a slice here, you project on the DDX axis, and then you look at the particles, if they correspond to, for example, here or there, and then depending on that, you give an identity. For instance, if I am trying to calculate uh, the number of pions in this example, so this one is going to be 100% pion, and two is, let's say, 60%, three is zero, and four is zero. In the end, if I know that this two is exactly pion, then I can say that, okay, my number of pion is two. But I don't know, then I have to cut it. So this is this cut phase approach. But in the, the identity, I can also count the, the probabilities. Then I can sum the probabilities. Then in the end, I have got 1.6 sum of probabilities. And this is not exactly the number, but at least it gives me a sum of the probabilities. And in the end, when I do it with all the particles that I have, I have got such a distribution. And one is this blue, which is this probability counting, input for the T identity, and the other one is this cut-based approach, where we have always integer numbers. And this is my distribution, as I have shown you also before. And in the cut-based, you get directly your uh, moments of particle, that's very trivial, and in the identity, you do this unfolding approach, and in the end, you get the same number. But as I said, in any case, you have, you have some loss of particles, and then you have to correct for this effect. So this is the challenge number two. So what it means is that, for example, you can run an event generator like hygiene, and then you produce some number of particles, and you look at generated number of protons as a function of reconstructed number of protons. And as you see, there is this correlation. And then when I take one slice again from here, for a given number of protons for an event, you see that there is a spread. If I am losing particles completely randomly, it means that this should be like binomial, but for this species, it should be really like a Gauss. But it is not the case. So you see that there is some deviation, which is coming from your detector. So one has to understand this effect. But before that, one can also check if this deviation is significant or not. And what we do for this, we look at our event generator calculates the same observable, kappa 2 over scalar, but which should give me uh, one, ideally, but there is some physics. This is my 
physics coming from the, 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 the model. And then in one case, you have got reconstructed, and then the green is regenerated. And if I correct analytically, there is analytical formulas to correct for the efficiency, and you get, for example, a very nice closure. And in the, set, in the third, the same. So this basically concludes that my efficiency loss and correction algorithm, everything is robust for this level. So then I can trust my data. And then I can move on. And then this volume effects, as I said before. So this is again a simulation. So you look at number of particles in your event. And then you look at this impact parameter, which is basically defining your overlap. So the distance between this, uh, the center of this MPI. This is what the experimentalists would see, and this is what the theorists would see. And in the end, what we do is that we take, for example, experimentally the centrality percentiles, as I have shown you before. And when you, for example, take this 5 to 10% centrality window, number of wounded nucleons, let's say your uh, particle production sources, so it will fluctuate. So it's not like a fixed number. And in the end, this would have some implication. So you, I, for example, get rid of this volume term by taking the ratio, but when it fluctuates, how does it affect my data? For this, this is a simulation. And as I said, for the second and the third order cumulants, things are very nice at LHC energies because many things cancel out analytically. And then on the fourth moment, we see a deviation. For example, if, every, if there is no volume and fluctuation effect, if the wound of nucleons is basically fixed, then this is what you get as one. But if there is this volume fluctuation effect, you see that the centrality being with here is half of these other guys. And then you get this deviation. And this is a toy model, there is no physics inside. And then we can also put everything into a real physical model, either EPOS or hygiene. EPOS is including um, all this collective behavior, and hygiene basically more or less like a superposition of proton-proton uh, collisions. Depending on the momentum range, which means that depending on the number of particles that you analyze, then you get a deviation from this uh, one. And why is it so important? For example, the signal that I am trying to get is like 30% from this HRG baseline. And as you can see here, just this one single detector effect is producing a gigantic difference, which is a factor almost 10, 20, more than what we expect. And so this is this paper now, which is recently also published by Paul Kayama and Roman. I would call it the ultimate signal. We are not there yet. Yes. I hope <laughs> <laughs> that it is. Yeah. So we will study and then see yeah. if we are really convinced. Yeah. This, for example, effect will be gone. And this is a this is going to be a very important step towards the discovery because without correcting this effect, we should forget about uh, any claim. You cannot be a referee. <laughs> <laughs> you are so biased. I am very biased. <laughs> I mean, I will check also and then see if it's so. so let's see. Anyway. Okay, so what did we learn from the experiment? So before going into jumping into the real data, we have to keep in mind two things. For example, we are looking at this ratio, kappa 2 over scalar, as a function of acceptance, right? This is what I have shown before. And if the acceptance is for pi, since I'm looking at a concert quantity, so it should not fluctuate, so it should be zero. That's why it should go all the way down to zero. But if I narrow down the acceptance, then I start seeing fluctuations, but the source, I don't know. And if it is too narrow, then you end up with this uh, Poisson in baseline. And this signal could be anything, as Volodya was saying. So it could be power number conservation, could be volume fluctuation, resonance decays, uh, annihilation, uh, initial state fluctuations, and so on. So this is one thing that one has to keep in mind. There is this deviation, but what? Another thing, as I promised, we could also address um, the time of the correlation. For example, if you consider this time evolution, and this is the Z in Sominkowski space, if the correlation happens between these two particles at very early times, and in the end, in the phase space, you see them in your detector as very long range correlation. Like jets, for example, they are usually back to back because they are very, um, very early produced. And depending on the length constraint that we put, we would also learn what is the source of the, the correlation in terms of time. 
And the other thing, as I said, this symbol could be anything, like for example, resonance decays. This we can check uh, looking at pi plus, pi minus, namely net pi on or net k on, because we know that they are dominated by the resonances. In the data, it's difficult to remove all resonances, but what we can do is that we can measure in data, and then with the hygiene, I can measure exactly the same thing because we know that more or less hygiene describes the resonances in a good way in terms of pi plus pi minus at least. And when I remove resonances, you see that there is a large effect. So in the end, it means that when we choose our observable, we have to be very careful. Either we choose something which is completely free of all these things, or we need to know how do we deal with these additional signals that we are not actually interested. But that's why usually traditionally we also look at uh, this kind of proxy to proton, because we know that there's almost no resonances we came into proton and anti-proton. There is J psi, but uh, it, is, it is negligible. Okay, another thing, for example, as I said, another effect, baryon number conservation. So in this paper, what is shown is that this time baryons are kind of uh, considered, simulated. So that's why this acceptance factor alpha means that it is 4 pi is 1, and then you are just narrow down the window. And if I, for example, consider uh, order number conservation in uh, full phase space, then you see that, as I said, it's zero. And then uh, you get this red line, which is saying that if I, for example, produce one baryon and the second baryon could be anywhere, which means that I globally conserve it, then this is the red line that you get. But if I produce one baryon and the other baryon could be within a given volume, like that we define, then you get this kind of a kick here. So, which means that the larger the kick, basically the smaller the correlation volume. And we can do the same thing, but we can correlate uh, the light sign pairs. Like I can produce one baryon and the other baryon, then I can correlate. And then the correlation length, again, I can tune. But this time the kick is on the other direction. So, which means that my physics mechanism could basically lead the deviation either down or up. But this has to be really understood. So I understand. So what is this white plot? I mean, I understand the left plot. Is positive signal? So this one, the, the correlation is put in between baryon baryon and antibaryon antibaryon. Oh, I see. Like a cluster formation okay. or something like that. Okay, okay. And in the end, as I said, so if I have a smaller correlation, which means that I am probing something very close to the end of the collision, like late, but if it is like back to back, which means like red one, then it means that the correlation has to come from very early times. So this is how to interpret the things that I will show now. And now this is real data. So what is shown here is this again, kappa two over scalar. Our baseline is one, this time as a function of centrality and as a function of delta eta for the highest centrality beam here. I take this first one and then just plot it as a function of centrality. The first thing that we see is that yes, we see a signal but we don't. We need to understand what exactly is this signal. And for this, we also plot hygiene and EPOS that we know at what exactly is happening inside. And then, as I said, so we can, for example, try to understand this data in terms of viral number conservation. We know that viral number conservation is pulling things down. And then I can estimate the correlation length from here. For example, the data is deviating very small. But for example, hygiene is very large. So if you go here, so hygiene would be like this and data would be more or less like this. So it means that in the end, data says that long range correlations should happen. And the hygiene basically says, no, it should be short. And data is basically completely ruling out the short range correlations. So which means that if you rely on string fragmentation in your hadronization, it means that it is basically not describing your data very well. So this is what we can learn. And how about strangeness? Yeah, can I ask? Uh, yeah. So, uh, how, how do you get the, the curves, local conservation, well, the curves, right? Not so hygiene this, input, but the curves, yes. So these ones. Yes, how, so, how do you get them? Yeah, these ones okay. actually the, the formulation of that one, previous version. Yeah, I understand, but uh, you, need to know, you need to know what is alpha, right? Yeah. So you need to know the total four pi number of variants. So, yeah, so where do you get it? So either you, I think, as far as I remember, so we use either hygiene, like a model, mm -hmm. or you can extrapolate with okay. the, with the, with the whatever measurement that we have in the. Okay. Market. Well, I, I assume that uh, 
uh, hope that they, they, do, they give same result, right? Because you just showed that hygiene doesn't work here. Yes. But you yeah. use it to show that it does. You use hygiene to show that hygiene doesn't work, right? In a way, in a sense, because you take but alpha. alpha from alpha deviation for hygiene is going to be somewhere very, I mean, the, this yeah. alpha is very small here, the deviation coming from gray. What is alpha? Alpha is the acceptance factor, which basically determines this yeah. line here. Yeah, so alpha is so a one minus alpha is this distance. Yeah. Yeah. Acceptance. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. alpha is a fraction of number of protons in acceptance over so number of baryons in full space, space, which we don't know, but we have to estimate yeah. it, for example, using hydrogen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. But the thing is that our acceptance is so small and the 4 pi is so large, that the, the very small uncertainties in your denominator is usually causing very minor differences. You get what I mean? Because your multiplicity in the, in the this I will also show in the plot later, uh, is like 5% of the full acceptance, even 2, 2% two of the full baryon number. So I, what I'm trying to say is that if I count all protons in my acceptance and divide it to the 4 pi all baryons, then it's like 2%. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's, it that's my data, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah, yeah. that's the data it is. But it starts it's to matter. It's hygiene that I say, right? Yeah. But yeah. the data it should be also on the level of maybe it could be maximum three or plus minus one percent, but it cannot be like five percent. So this is what I mean. Because the denominator is too large. Yeah, but I mean, the, in the end, what matters is deviation from unity. Exactly. So then yeah. all the, the tiny details play a larger role, right? Yeah, and sure. that's what we're looking at. Yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. so, so this one is, for example, uh, what we get. Yeah, this is, and this, this uncertainty is, yeah. comes from two models, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. So you can get it from two different models, and then you assign it to the uncertainty here. So, so Nisad, I understand about the local conservation. Yeah. But what drives the local conservation? Is the decay of, uh, globally, the number is conserved, you can understand. Yeah, exactly. So the source, to be honest, yesterday we were discussing the volatility. The source is not known. So I will also the come to this. Yeah, because, I mean, it could be resonances one thing, mm -hmm. right, can localize the things, and the other local effects could come from... Yeah, so just like, any production, right? Any, well, essentially, everything here is produced barons at LHC and mean rapidity. Yeah. Or and they're like, usually produced in pairs, so you can imagine a microscopic process, some hard scattering at given rapidity produces baryon and baryon pair. Yeah. And so, if, they, if unless it's produced at very early time, there is just... Uh, they cannot be, the, the correlation lengths can't be too long. It's no. it's either it's a pair production or something. For example, pair production. Yeah. Resonance is, well, we don't know any resonance which resonance decays into, 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 into two variants, variant and anti yeah. uh, But uh, pair production, for example, I think you would expect something yeah. like that. The only thing in terms of resonances can affect is that it plays around with your denominator because it goes into your acceptance. Um, yeah, exactly. Right. So these kind of effects, like for example, how the jet uh, fragments, fragmentation produces protons, they also go into your sample. So it is to me not clear, and I will come to that how we can distinguish these effects. So do you understand why your 5 GB, 5 TeV data are below the 2 yeah. TeV data? Yeah, this we don't understand. We will also discuss, because intuitively this should, should go the other way above. Yes. Okay. Exactly, it should be above. But we check the data in two different methods, and 5 TV indeed below. So, which means that when we increase the energy, this local contribution is also increasing. If this is the case, right? I mean, yeah. that's counterintuitive, right? Yeah. yeah. Because uh, there, some local effects are coming in, yeah. but the sources we don't know, yeah. and that's that's the reason actually. In the next step, I am trying to go a bit more differential yeah. energy. Try to understand what 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 is what is this. Yeah, maybe just last question. There has to be a connection to balance functions. This exactly. This which yeah. were published previously, right? So yeah. what, what, what and is shown? Brad, yeah. Brad and shown. There's a paper from yeah. two, early two thousand. Right, and there is at least paper. I think is that so? Yeah, yeah. balance yeah. functions. Yes, yeah. yeah. and Claude and Gingy. Right. right. Yes. yes. So yes. in principle, they should see the same thing, right? If you, yes. yeah. Yeah. If you do Google Translate, that you show exactly. between these two. Oh, yeah, yeah. This. this is very similar. Yeah, so, sure. so they see also narrower exactly. balance function at 5 TV than at 2 TV. Yeah, because in this model, you know, for example, in this version, so the in the in the first version, uh, what Anar and the, the, the Al basically were doing is that producing one proton 
And the second one could be uniformly everywhere. So which means that probably distribution function is like flat. And in this new version, they assume some distribution. So they also kind of try to relate it to this balance function with because you cannot produce the proton everywhere, right? It cannot be uniform. So there is some probably distribution which is related to the balance function also. You get what I mean? Yeah, I understand. I mean, it's just, I just wanted to maybe to look at the data for the balance function. Yeah, because sure. this is not thread, right? This is yeah. something else. Uh, I think to translate that this balance function bit into this uh, rows. Yeah, so this is what I'm trying to say. So once you relate them, then you, you should basically see the same thing. Analytically, the observable is kind of identical. It should be an integral of one thing. You exactly. Do nothing to it, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. And then, so this is what I have shown. And the second thing, for example, from baryon number, I make the conclusion. So, okay, so the baryon number is conserved in the long range. And then we can look at strangeness. This is just two different um, way of looking at the data in terms of hadronization. So one can look at Lundstrom fragmentation and look at the particle ratios here as a function of multiplicity, or you can look at them in view of canonical statistical model. So enhancement or suppression logic. So for the first uh, moments, which means that for the, the, the mean of these distributions, you're kind of able to describe. And what we have done is that we looked at net psi and the correlation of net psi to net uh, k on, the same logic again, kappa 2 over scalar, but this time double strange psi is considered. And then we again, in the data, as a function of full system range, we see a deviation. And then to see it even more explicitly, you can look at the correlation of net psi to net k on, since they are free from the resonance effect again. Then we again see this behavior. And you see that basically data can be described very nicely with this model. And with putting some correlation length, which is comparable to the net baryon. It's 3 dv dy, what I see here. I can apply it exactly here. And the data describes also this. But when we look at the, the string model again, it is again shooting off. So it means that in the first order level, one harmonization mechanism can explain the data with some tuning. But when you look at the second, then it fails. So it means that we are trying to go up to six order to go for discovery, but on the way, we can also address really interesting physics. And all these things has to be understood, only then you can construct this more complex six order. And a little bit lost from page 19 to page 21, what do we learn? So from here? Yes. Yeah, the volume that I have here is 3 dB divided. Okay. And the data can be described with this volume, but the hygiene which is this Lund model again, cannot describe it all. Okay. And then here, I do the same thing. I describe net psi, that strangeness this time, again with the same level of volume, 3 dv dy. Again, the Lund is shooting off. So these two pictures are consistent. I can describe net baryon and net uh, strangeness with the canonical description, but not with the Lund model description. So, uh, and... Is, is it consistent that uh, you get closer to zero in hygiene because you argue that the correlation length is too small? In height, yeah, this, right? this description is changing, it is turning things the other way around. So this, uh, this role, the, yeah. from the definition, it is like this. Yeah, in yeah. other words, if you do VC equal two times dv dy, it will go up or, or it will go down. Uh, if you make the lower, it go down. It, it go, go up. up. Yeah. Okay, so exactly. it's consistent. Yeah, it is consistent. Yes, yes. So this we check is the right product the product function of a particle multiplicity. Yeah. Which canonical model are we talking about? This, <laughs> this one. Yeah. So the canonical model fits each point? Uh, uh, the trend. So this one, this yellow. Yeah. So how, how does the canonical model predict this? So like each multiplicity you can see. Each multiplicity. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the previous slide, it's uh, no, okay. It's not it's the same model, no, 20. It's not the same model, but uh, the model that they show on slide 21 was fitted to yields as function of the, the different multiplicities. And then you have temperature and, uh, and uh, dv dy 
as function of multiplicity, and then you use this as input and you calculate fluctuations. That, that, that's how it was obtained. Yeah. So yields fixed the thermal parameters, and then the exactly. model with the fixed like parameters calculate yeah. the fluctuations. And about the right figures, so in the data I see there is a jump for so here yeah. left, right? Yeah, this one. Yeah, so this jump, a similar jump also we see in the in the yields. In the yields also. The right? size there was, there was a jump. This one on one data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is also this jump. On the page nineteen, also the same model. Page nineteen. Yes. Uh, oh. In this one, no, this is a different model. But let me translate this volume to to this to the fist is giving basically the constant. Can this model reproduce this? Model? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it, uh, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reproduces. I mean, the errors are pretty big here as well. Yeah. Some of them. And this is. Uh, to be honest, but yes. Yeah, exactly. This was kind of old, but in the in the new description, so we will also put the same model in the same left area. Okay, so this is basically what we learned so far. And in but the don't end, you have trouble with the Deuteron proton calculations or what is it? And yeah, exactly. So then you come with a different. The volume was about 1.6. Yes, right. And so then this was kind of with the coalescence switch exactly, and so on. Exactly. And that's why we uh, try to now isolate the volume number conservation yes. looking at lambda neutron correlations okay. so that we would really see okay, rather exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, but does that mean the model can? Produce all these uh, What is the rule? What, what is the rule? Yeah. This is the correlation. The correlation. Uh, correlation between the psi and the theta. Okay. That's the. I can cover two. I mean, cover two is fluctuations. Cover two is cover yeah. two. Second cover one is fluctuations. So the idea. And the uh, only rho two. is uh, the rho is what? The rho is the correlation okay. between net psi number and the net kaon number. Yeah. So this. One. The cross psi. correlation. Kaon because it is giving a much larger deviation. Because when you include k on yeah. one strangeness, because statistical uh, uncertainty of psi is very low, it's, it's very rare, double strange. But when you correlate it with the k on, then you, the, the strength of the, the, the model, the species is there, so you can also address these kind of correlations so that you can describe the same different observables with the same way. But of course, in the hygiene and so on, you, you don't have this flexibility to play with your correlation volume. So this is the advantage. So this means that the pre-unit reliability, 10 charge particles, the system is uh, sunlight. Well, this is the model of sun. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's, a, it's a thermal model. It has high mass. So strangeness is not fully thermalized. So yes. Yeah, and gamma s we checked actually with one or we fixed the gamma s. To oh, that's you that's should read my work when I proceed in 2000. I don't know this morning, folk and I are hiding. Can we see? 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 The process of summarization is proton, proton. Is uh, there sort of this discontinuity between PPP led and LED led? Mm -hmm. So this one. Yeah. So this I was trying to explain in view of the, the flow, I would say. Because um, when you have a push, very large push in your system, then it is changing your alpha a lot. So which means that number of protons, so as you know, so the, there is this mass dependence of flow, right? And you push your protons outside of your acceptance, and then you go to very um, large multiplicities. In, in, so that's why it creates an additional push. Uh, large you know, yeah. expansion. So it is kind of, I say it like there is a little bit of slight trend here going down. For example, hygiene is flat, and even in EPOS, when you add some collectivity, your thing is going down. And this is, I think, coming from this fact with the multiplicity, where you you might have this tendency as a function of centrality. But to be honest, yeah, also, also geometry changes, right? Pilet and lead lead. So pilet yeah. is not symmetric anymore. Yeah, that's 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 play some role. And that's okay, let's it. move on. Yeah. There's only 15 minutes left. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so this is another thing, a way of looking at the data. As I said, so we don't know the source of this locality. That's why we also try to push the limits to higher momentum. 
And what we have seen is that when I, for example, kind of try to fix my multiplicity, but change my momentum range, and then we see a little bit of a different trend as a function of centrality. So as I had explained before, this kind of a kick going down could be like unlike sign correlation, and this kind of a kick could be a like sign, could be cluster formation or whatever. And there is one explanation that I also put here is that if you look at this uh, second order susceptibilities as a function of magnetic field, so which means that when you put a magnetic field in, in the background of your equation of state, and in the end, it would result in kind of uh, different susceptibility. And if you take the ratio of, for example, peripheral, uh, the, the ratio of this kappa 2 to central 1, it should be 1 because you would not feel any magnetic field. But when you change the centrality, then you start feeling the magnetic field, then you should see a deviation. It is one kind of explanation, but it doesn't have to be true. And this is a kind of thing that one needs to try to understand. If we change my momentum acceptance, if this local physics that I can grab in a better way, looking at differential tool data. The cluster formation at high PT is, yeah. is less likely to something else. Exactly. I mean, what, what could be, I don't know. Or if the jets fragmentation, how do they produce something? I don't know. But the, alph but the alphas have been how similar they are. That's it's, I mean, in, 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 we checked with hygiene and EPOS, yes. it's plus minus 1% one one okay, so from uh, here to there. Yeah, but I think you, you don't really need EPOS or hygiene, right? You can just compare me now. Yeah, with yeah, this we will check. In the, during yeah. the paper preparation, we will, we will also see the if the alpha is quite smaller for some reason. Peripheral that explains everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this is uh, just a kind of um, thing that we need to keep in mind. We cannot always look at the same thing and then try to understand. Yeah. We have to go a little bit outside and then see what's really going on. But there is no thermal model calculation with magnetic. In progress. In progress. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, this is just the, the QA plot and kind of physics QA because we know that kappa 3 or kappa 2 should be zero because of the symmetry of the, the, the system at UD. And, and indeed, in the data, we get very close to zero. And here in the models, you see a slight wiggle here. And this is exactly what I have explained. Uh, if the, the net particle may, um, is not zero, then you would start seeing this volume fluctuation effect. And in the EPOS, for example, when you look at this PP bar ratio, you see that 1.025, and in hygiene, 1.008. That's why hygiene is much closer than EPOS. This is just the case. And in the future, now we are in a continuous readout phase where we are using GEMTPC, which means that we will have much larger statistics to test our system. And in the future, it will be like a complete new detector. This is just to show you with respect to the size. So the, the current ILIS is like this, and the, um, and the ILIS 3 will be like this tiny thing, but it is going to be much more powerful, much higher statistics, much larger acceptance, better PID, better efficiency, and a better vertexing. And in the end, this is just to show you what would it look like if I try to calculate kappa 6 over kappa 2 preliminary discovery. Alice 2 would give me a true sigma effect, and in Alice 3, hopefully, we will get even more than 4 sigma for central collisions, only looking at this Alice 2 exception section. This is just to, to give you an idea. And this is what I was discussing. So the, this 4 pi, this alpha factor that we discussed, actually, this is the current data that I show, number of protons as a function of eta. And then, so this black line is all full acceptance protons. And if you divide this guy to this black times two, this is what we get as alpha. And in Alice 3, what will happen is that we will have this um, green when we have this PID in the barrel, and then with the blue, with the barrel and the forward, and you see that in terms of alpha, kind of so to say, we will have a gain of 10 per 10, a factor of 10 increased number of protons. So what it really means, for example, if I look at kappa 2 scale lambda as a function of delta eta, 
with current data that I have shown you, we probe this and then a comparison to EPOS. And EPOS, I look with the red, more like soft particle production, and with the blue, more like harder, and 0.3 to 10, basically everything. So you see that when you change your momentum acceptance, and if your model includes some collective behavior, etc., then the, here, within this range, you always see a linear behavior, So which is very difficult to judge what is the source. But when you open up your acceptance, you see all the wiggles and saturation, and then you can really put all the models together and then see which one is really describing and which is not. So that's why I think it could be very uh, strong for the future. And this is just a summary of what we have learned. And I think I don't need to, to go through. If you want, I can flash the exotic one. Yes, please. <laughs> this is uh, more fun. Yeah. On, the, on the trend, rising trend for the magnetic field, do we have uh, string models to describe it? Or? So how does EPOS or IG, for example? No, no, they, they are flat. flat. Yeah. They are completely flat. OK, so the other thing is that, for example, this is just an analogy. For example, so this is the, the full spectrum of light. And daily life, we see only this visible part, right? And this is exactly like this. So we are looking at this visible part of this energy loss spectrum. And above this limit, we have no idea because our detectors are not able to see. It's just like they're our eyes. But um, in principle, there could be anything. So these are like ordinary particles, but maybe there are some marvel world outside. And for this, we have to push the limits. Our devices should not only detect like visible light like this, but it should really push the limits to the infra DDX, so to say. And the idea is that if you have very large magnetic fields, and then uh, this, with this Schwinger production mechanism, what might happen is that you can produce monopole, monopole pairs from the vacuum. And then what the monopole means, so it is basically an isolated... I mean, I'm sorry, for that you don't, you just don't know which particle to identify particle ID, right? But you right. still have calorimeters like Haronic calorimeters, Haronic yeah. calorimeters, which does not have the limit. Yeah, I will come to that. Yeah. Right. So why, why it is a challenging thing to, to measure these kind of particles? It's not like you don't know anything. I mean, there is something you know, right? Beyond that, uh, you're tracking. Right? Yeah, now yeah. I will come to that. So how, how you make the discovery. So this is basically making your maximal equations much more poetic. So even if they don't exist, I wish could exist otherwise it would look really cool and look at this with the magnetic monopole it looks really beautiful and properties like stable massive particle whatever everything one can read here there is also famous versions of the monopoles in grand unified theories which is not point like particles but with the composite objects but we cannot access the access these but there are also electroweak theories and so on that you can really have a mass range which can be detected for the monopoles. In a very simple assumption, if I have a monopole with uh, like Dirac monopole, then the energy loss of this guy would be like 4,700 um, more than a pion. So imagine that you have got something like this, like, like really like smashing your detector. So it's really very difficult to detect. And for this, um, I will explain how we do it with the TPC. So this is the TPC, and this is how the readout unit of the TPC looks like, which is this gem points for stacks. This part is a bit uh, technical, but uh, maybe it would be also nice. So in the TPC, what you do is that you have got this 2.5 meter long volume of gas, and there is one centimeter of readout unit here. When a particle crosses, it ionizes the gas, and then you get some electron and ion pair. You collect ions upwards and electrons. They all go to this one centimeter amplification area. And then what you do is that you, from one electron, you produce 2,000 so that you should be able to see a signal. Otherwise, one electron will be lost in your noise, in your electronics. And this is how the technology works. And if you look at the track on this uh, sector projection, XY projection, 
what you do is that you calculate a heat point, like an ionization point, and this ionization point gives you this kind of a peak. And this is what we call as a cluster in time direction, which is along the z, and then path along the xy direction. And then all these heat points gives you this chaotic picture. And when you fit these little, little points, then you get your tracks. And then when you calculate the sum of the charge per track, then you build your particle identification. This is how it works, basically. But the problem is that the height of this guy is not infinite. So the detector limits this. In every detection technique, silicon or whatever, you always have a limit in your dynamic range. So you cannot measure infinite. So the EDX, sorry for asking this stupid question, yeah. the EDX is measured in your gems or what? Or what? Uh, it is, um, so the ionization yes. gives you some number of electrons. Yes. Sometimes one, sometimes 100, sometimes okay. 20. <coughs> And this one is multiplied in your gems with a gain factor. Oh, so you count the ionization along the track via your multiplication. Exactly. Okay. For and that gives this, you the EDDX, the number exactly. of electrons I make along the track. Exactly. Okay, all right, then I get it. Okay. Like it gives you a Landau distribution yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. and the mean you cut it. And then the problem is the following. If we, for example, have some extreme ionization, so what would it look like? This is a laser, this is a laser calibration run. We, for example, shoot some laser tracks here. This is an XY projection. And then if you look at this one cluster and you look at the signals, what happens? You hit the maximum and your chip cannot digest any further. It cannot go up and then it gets stuck and then it saturates for a long time and then you go back to your baseline. And then it creates two things. One is the saturated signal which cannot be reconstructed normally. And usually this tail is cut. That's why when you hit this very large DDX in, moment, in the protons and so on, then you saturate. And these kind of signals are always rejected from dynamics. And at the same time, you see a negative signal, which is the so-called common mode. And what is it? I will come to that. So if I, for example, look at monopole, monopole will give me exactly this kind of a signal. But how does it look like? So, since it's a magnetically charged particle, it will not bend like this, but it will be like flat. And then, but when I look at XY projection, so this is my uh, beam direction, and since when the monopole goes like this, then it will get the kick from the magnetic field, and it will bend. And then it will give a parabolic trajectory. So, which means that to claim if this is a monopole, I need to see the full track, with the topology of the track and the energy loss of the track. So if I know, for example, in the, the, the calorimetry something, it means that you saw something, but what? You don't know. So this is the, the, the trouble. Why is it a parabola? Because you accelerate along, I thought you drift. So I don't so know. So the, the track is the, thing, the, the magnetic field doesn't do anything to the monopole, right? Uh, it, it kicks it. Because of the, the, the magnetic field. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, your magnetic field yeah, goes right. this way, accelerate. Okay, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, and got then, yeah, so yeah. this is a very simple sketch. So this is the ionization as a function of um, time. So this is the saturation domain, and this is our normal particle domain. So monopole is going to be always in the saturation domain. It will give me so many number of signals always looking like this. But if you look at other particles, they will be somewhere in your dynamic range. And when they slow down, they give you a break peak. And this break peak will be very short. So which means that if I see a track which is very long living in the saturation domain, it means that I can really track it and then claim that this is a monopole. And other technologies cannot do that. Because monopole is losing energy so fast in the material, in maybe two, three hits, it can stop. I cannot really track it. But if it reaches the TPC, gas is almost zero material. So it will be like a free fly. So that's the logic. I have a question here. Then it also loses some energy when it goes through the silicon part. Exactly. Right? Can this they survive? The, this is the main uncertainty. So in the other searches, like uh, in Atlas and Modal and so on, this is the main uncertainty because the coupling is not known with the material. Usually what people do is that they look at the beam pipe if the monopole is too slow, low momentum, it might get stuck in the beam pipe, they look at it. 
But if it crosses the beam pipe, it can get stuck in the silicons. Mm -hmm. And this is not known. And the advantage of Alice is that in terms of material budget in the silicons, it is the, the least in FLXC. So that's why if it reaches the TPC, it is much likely than the, the other detectors. In Atlas, for example, they triggered this transition radiation far, and more probably they got stuck. Okay, and then uh, the, the idea that we say, so this baseline signal that I have shown. Just trying to, what determines the curvature in this case, the mass so uh, the, the charge, the magnetic charge. Yeah, magnetic charge. Plus the momentum of the particles. If it is really high momentum, you cannot bend it with your 0 0.5 Tesla, because it's a weak magnetic field. But it is low momentum, then it goes and immediately bends. It loses the energy. That's what I'm saying. The curvature depends on the mass. Mm. Mass, and you know, yeah, exactly. Because mass it bends in a different direction. It bends along the C-axis. It doesn't bend in exactly. the transverse, right? Because exactly. the, the magnetic monopole sees the, the magnetic field like a Coulomb field. No, what, what, like no, a no, the magnetic field is, uh, is, is uh, along the beam line. Is along the beam exactly. line, right? Yes. Yeah. So it, but it, if it has transverse momentum, I'm saying. No, no, but it goes, but it, it doesn't go, if this is a transverse plane, in the transverse plane, it goes straight. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, the I know, but the, that's makes, why I said the curvature here is along the, the C direction. Along the C direction, yes, and then it, it goes straight in the transverse direction. On the exactly. it goes that direction, but then, that's what it is. then it depends on mass. That, yeah, 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 exactly. Because mass determines the, the main energy, because yeah. it's very, very massive. And then this signal that I mentioned to you about this common mod, this is the main idea that we propose in this paper. So when you have a signal in you know, one of these gem foils, because it is really like a circuit. So there is a gem foil, and just behind it, there's a pet plane where you measure your signal. And it's really like a capacitance. So if you receive a signal here, then it will induce a charge everywhere. So if I, for example, receive a signal here, like 100, then this 100 will be distributed all the pads just behind it. So it means that number of pads will be by normalization. So that's why you see a tiny signal here and there is a gigantic one here. And then this is a typical simulation. So if I have some multiplicity of very high central red event, my baseline is always going down because I continuously dump charge into my capacitor. And then the, the, the pads will go down continuously. And this we corrected online in the in the hardware. And why we are correcting it, we already calculated my baseline shift. And then look at this, for example. This is a laser signal. And you see my mean baseline is on the level of 3 ADC count in a central level event. But if there is a gigantic signal, then it is going to be 180. It's like 100 ADC. So which means that our, Pions, kaons, and so on, they will produce, produce such a kind of baseline, but one monopole will, be, will give me a, such a gigantic baseline shift. So what we propose is that, okay, instead of trying to find something above, try to find something below. And since it is like a hardware knowledge, then it, before it goes through all your reconstruction chain, particle finding, and so on, you already kind of identify it on the fly. I trigger it, I save the full uh, signal, and then analyze it later. So this is what we propose. And this is just to give you an um, idea how such a signal looks like. So in this one, we see it is 200. The length of the tail is 200. You have, you have to show with the mouse. Yes. Ah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you see it is 200, the length. Yes. And then the, the signal here is on the level of 80 ADC. And now, uh, here, it is 700. So I really found an APP event, which is more or less on the level of a monopole, like from the break peak. It is really gigantic, but you see it is cut because of the reconstruction. What we propose is that once I see this, then don't cut it, but save the whole signal. And like this, I can really identify because I will see all the signals produced by this monopole. And in the end, it is just like fishing. So we just wait, switch on your uh, hardware trigger and then wait. When you find something, it will be saved into a different storage. 
and then time to time go and then check if it is full or not. It is really like fishing. So this is basically it for the for the BSM search, the plan, okay. and it will run uh, until 2030, and hopefully we find something. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. More questions. Yeah. Like, is there already plan on like implementing this kind of hardware here? Uh, this one, uh, we did, I mean, uh, the calculation of this part is there, uh -huh. and we just need to put the decision to save it somewhere. And for this, I go for a fund because <laughs> so we will save an additional disk. Uh -huh. So this will require additional permission from the detector, which I can take, but then it will require some budget. So, but uh, it is uh, maybe there. next year. Uh, this, I think, uh, we will already decide in the next one two months. Oh, okay. Exactly, and then we will test it before LED LED comes. And this year, LED LED it will be in in the system. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Do you plan to run theory solution huh? run without the because monopole can come anywhere. Anywhere, yeah, exactly. Whenever you switch on your detector, the collision system it doesn't matter. Do you plan to run without collision? Uh, there is always cosmic. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. but, but the magnetic field you... also costs money, right? And so, and, uh, yeah, exactly. So there is always cosmic runs that we use for some alignment, calibration, and so on. And during that time, it will be also on. And cosmics are very rare, but you never know <laughs> if yeah. God sends you a monopole. <laughs> for one of them. That's what right. is the rate? The rate, so usually uh, in terms of production mechanism, they always make an assumption because production mechanism is not known. Jalian is the one that they, they always assume. And the other one is now uh, Schrodinger production mechanism. And in this one, actually, there's a nature paper. And my goal is to search mainly in the lead lead. But in PP, there are limits already put by Atlas and CMS. In terms of luminosity, I cannot compete with Atlas in PP, but in that we are all in the same world. So we will see the same physics, but with this technique, I think I can really find it, but it's very unlikely that Modal and Atlas would see that because of the material budget, as you were saying. Yeah, but that's why, so why, that's why I thought you could compete with Atlas even in PP. Because you, if yeah. I understood you right, you have a much cleaner way of in measuring P, this. Uh, so, in the only problem in PP that I have is the luminosity. So, yeah, but if I have a high luminosity garbage, that doesn't help me at all. Even a low luminosity clean measurement that might be better than yeah. high luminosity. I mean, have because you have never know exactly when it is produced. This is also another thing. Yeah. So, it kind of its advantages yes. because it is my. Cleaner, exactly. but I cannot collect as many collisions as possible. Yeah. And let's see, because even one uh, track would be a discovery. Exactly. So, <laughs> and so what no, are the, what are the really backgrounds you expect? I mean, so for your trigger, right? I mean, if I have a fat nucleus coming from cosmic rays, or yeah, this is products. Yes. But these are always very short. Actually, short like what? In what? In, in, the, in the track. In, in, in the project, in the, yeah, they fly very short because you kick the uh, high nuclei yes. and then they are very low momentum. That's why they go and then pop. They stop and then you give red kick. I see. So actually this kind of background measurements model did and they always see tiny, tiny tracks everywhere. And my goal is to, to catch... Uh, where was it actually? <coughs> Ah, so this one, for example, the, the spallation products will be in the, mon right. in the domain like very shortly, like for example, this length. But the monopole will be very long. Why is that? I mean, why doesn't the monopole give me a break peak? Because the, the, the energy loss, the nature, is like decaying in time. And all ordinary particles, they lose their energy by increasing the energy loss. And monopole is the, the other way around. This is what the... the the electric, even magnetic field, it means, I think. 
and the coping with the light. How do you get from for this year's uh, model? Yes. I would like to come, come back to yes. my last question today mm -hmm. to you. What is the Alice strategy to see experimentally the source crossover? The sixth moment is the, the main one. So this is, I mean, so yeah, so there are not so many groups looking at the net. So now the second, so now there is, not third. So the, the, the goal is now that the fourth is now in place. So, so there is one PhD student working on the fourth. But once we have this uh, machinery working, we will calculate all of them. But six, with the current statistics, impossible. But your PP, PP, yes. PP we look for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In PP, we will definitely check. But the uh, uh, non binomial effect does not happen the fourth automation, so it's uh, the detector efficiency. So, these, all these models we will try to fit at the same time. Like, for example, this is the, the point. In each moment, we will try to describe the data. Imagine that, for example, I describe the second moment with the body number conservation with some volume, but the fourth is off. You get what I mean? So, we will try to, to get the all of them at the same time. Yeah. But the closure is, is yet to be done for the fourth order, for the efficiency. Yeah, sure. It is not there yet. I mean, there was a fourth moment calculation, I mean, a measurement in the past, but it didn't really converge in the end. So, the analyzer also left and so on. I remember this. Yes, yes. exactly. Walk, walk right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We wanted to, to reduce the amount of physics methods, but uh, yes. yeah. Yeah. regarding the current moment, if I may. So, um, your argument was it should be zero because of symmetry, right? The third moment of net proton. Um, yeah, the skewness should be. Uh, like, yeah. But there is, there was a this paper, if I remember correctly, measuring new B with slight nucleus, something like that. And they have new B about one sigma, something about zero. So, how close to zero it should be? I guess yeah, that this, would be this, a I question. This, yeah, it's, it's this paper that I think you mean. And did you draw? No, 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 not that you draw the yields. They just fit yields with thermal model. Yeah, yeah. And is, maybe you have it somewhere here, but it's not the correlations. It's it the is not archive, this paper. Yeah. Uh, uh, a year ago or two. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, know, I think it's Mario Chaco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It is, it is yeah. on archive, not published. Okay. Yeah. So, um, right. So, this one. there was a week, pretty weak one. I think it was before. Or it was already for, or maybe it was only uh, proceeding at the time. But uh, yes, there was some weak evidence for mm -hmm. positive mu b, which would be a weak positive kappa. That would be the expectation. And the question is, how much positive can it be? Right. Uh, well, and the question is, maybe you're overdoing it if you force it to be zero. No, exactly. That's, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this paper you mean, right? Uh, Think so, yes. And this one. So this is the point that you mean. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly what was the UB value, but if I re yeah, what, what, <laughs> what I recall. I mean this this one is the old one with this huge gigantic. Okay, device. it's one MEV. Yeah. Right? And point seven. Point, point seven, seven MEV, exactly. Okay, but plus so minus so something. So it's so it is not crossing for sure. So, so it's uh, zero practically uh, purpose. It's mu B over T which counts. So it's yep. zero mm -hmm. point. Oh, oh, four. Yes, okay. Right. 0 0.7 no, uh, zero. MEV plus minus 0 0.004. Yes, no, exactly. no, 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 I mean the, the expected uh, kappa 3. Uh, kappa 3 over kappa 2. Ah, so it is not going to be exactly 0. No. Yes. Yeah, but, sure, sure, sure. Right. But it is going to be very, very close. Yeah, so the question is how close is this? All right. Further discussion.